because I was reading about energy stuff today. I was on a, a geopolitics Twitter chat with Patrick and a bunch of uh, really sort of well-spoken, prominent academics a couple days ago. And the guy, uh, Freddie Ponton, went into this long, in-depth explanation, which is one of the best I'd heard, about the nor- the nerd stream of pipeline and the energy wars behind Ukraine. And it's really good. So if you haven't heard that, go watch that. It's on my um, speaker feed, on my podcast feed, on my Rockfin. But uh, the first speaker I wanted to invite uh, onto the stage uh, is a author. Um, he is also, well, he's, he's versed in many fields, um, and as well as history and philosophy. Uh, he's the author of Esoteric Hollywood 1 and 2. Um, his website is jaysanalysis.com. And Jay, I wanted to first, I think you're probably the suitable person to kick this off, just to give us a little bit of historical perspective. A lot of people who are listening or who follow your work or our work at 21st Century Wire will uh, be familiar with terms like Operation Mockingbird. They will have seen the uh, church committee hearings. Um, They will understand uh, the, the relationship between the military industrial complex, intelligence agencies, and the media, how the CIA is intimately involved in shaping narratives. Um, but I know you've also you've not just studied about this, you've written about it. Um, you've also, you're widely read on this topic. Um, so when I say war propaganda, uh, modern war propaganda, uh, tell us uh, what first comes to mind and, and sort of take us through. Uh, in the best way you can, uh, a sort of light introduction on this topic. Yeah, thank you, Patrick. I'm honored to be here. Yeah, in my view, I think that what makes 20th, 21st century war propaganda unique is the intense level of scientific sophistication. And we might think that sounds uh, counterintuitive given how lowbrow a lot of propaganda, especially war propaganda, is usually pulling on the heart springs, uh, Syrian Dusty Boy comes to mind as a classic example. But, you know, this goes back to Bush era. We think about the babies in the incubators uh, with Saddam. These are just classic techniques, but they have really been um, tweaked. I think that uh, what I've been looking at more recently is going into <clears throat> the history of the admin. People like Walter Lippmann, uh, I just got his classic text, uh, Public Opinion, uh, in the other day. Now, I've done lectures through Bernays's propaganda, but Lipman's public opinion actually comes before that. And um, really, the, the locus of this uh, idea of shaping people's opinion through public polling, especially in the maybe in the uh, great generation, the boomer era, polls I think had a lot more power and influence than they do nowadays post internet. But it turns out that all of this was really studied from a psychological warfare perspective via the Tavistock Institute. And so we get, you know, the British uh, premier sort of brainwashing institute, uh, Tavistock, that comes out of the uh, post-World War I period out of Wellington House. And Wellington House was set up by um, you know, nascent British intelligence to really get uh, everybody's mindset behind World War I. And so they utilized a lot of what at that time were pretty revolutionary techniques. Uh, The figures like H.G. Wells were very prominent when it comes to drawing the enemy in very cartoonish ways. And so, again, we think of that as something kind of uh, bland nowadays for propaganda. But at that time, it was very revolutionary to draw uh, anybody who wasn't, you know, part of the British Empire as a very savage sort of bloodthirsty uh, cartoon character. Uh, But it worked. And so Wellington House was very successful. People like Arnold Toynbee, uh, other figures. And that that morphed into the Tavistock Clinic, which was studying shell shock. And it turns out, of course, that uh, the study of shell shock was applied then to the mass audience. And so propaganda is very, very useful for traumatizing. Uh, that's It has the goal of traumatizing. And they actually have a three-step process. Later, Tavistock figures uh, uh, passed even... Lipman's era would be figures like Dr. Kurt Lewin and John Rawlings Rees, who came up with these different techniques of blasting the public, basically, with different types of terror. 
uh, to then sort of put them in a catatonic state uh, and what they call a maladaptive process. And so the the trauma that, that occurs on an individual level is just sort of blasted macrocosm to the mass mind. And that's really the purpose, I think, of terror. And I think terror is also another form of propaganda and a form of war propaganda. The irony, of course, is that the neocons and people at the Rand Corporation and these entities, you know, they're directly connected to Tavistock and that people from Tavistock actually went and lectured at Rand. Uh, people like Dr. Kurt Lewin went to MIT, went and lectured through a bunch of uh, U.S. universities and think tanks. And and so this technique, this, uh, this op- opinion making strategy is just intensely scientific i guess is the way to put it nowadays now again it's you know when you go back to the era of polls it was all based on just made up polls and the idea was that most people didn't want to be a part of uh exclusion from a group the idea is that there's a psychological motivator for being part of the in crowd now if you if 80 percent support the war according to the quote poll even if the poll is completely made up People will default to that because they don't want to be uh, considered outsiders or you know not part of the group. This is where Tavistock pioneered what they call groupthink. So groupthink is actually a, a very sophisticated technique, as we said, for um, creating consent, creating conformity, and creating public opinion. So it's not really a, it's not like we're studying public opinion to see do you know eighty percent percent really support the war. No, we're actually manufacturing the consent. And uh, I would assume that, you know, that's where that famous term, I think it's Chomsky, right? That he's getting this from this technique of Tavistock, which you can see very clearly applied, uh, not just in every basically false flag that begin, usually begins a big conflict or a war, but as we get up into the period where, uh, you know, World War One, or excuse me, uh, Gulf War. And Gulf War is the first fully televised war. And Rand Corporation saw that as a very uh, unique revolutionary way again, to traumatize the populace. So if everybody's able to watch 24-7 with scrolling stats, you know, uh, of uh, troops, deployments, deaths, etc., you can begin to see how that same technology, that same method is used for uh, the last three years of the COOF, right? We get, oh, the daily death stats, all of that. Right? That's all psychological warfare. And it's, and it's no different between the battle against the amorphous, invisible terror opponents as it is the amorphous invisible biological threat of the virus right you can never win these battles you can never win these wars and they just morph the war on, they morph the war on terror into the war on the uh, so-called virus which is in the it becomes the basically the biosecurity state which is the result so just as 9-11 war on terror gives us the giant security state the war on the virus is the entrance to the doorway to the biomedical security state and actually white paper documents actually say this so this is not theory you can read the british ministry of defense document was declassified on transhumanism you can read the uh, nato document on uh, psychological warfare uh, cognitive warfare document they all talk about biosecurity and changing the mind and changing the brain so it's actually morphing into full-on uh you know changing dna right exactly what klaus talked about but anyway uh, long story short uh you know this is basically what we're seeing with war propaganda it's, it's really morphed into um uh is is really the war on terror uh applied to all forms of uh human life right? everything becomes now a potential terror zone even individual humans are now right potential virus emitters this is the narrative that we saw uh, post uh, coof uh, when, of course, that really probably relates instead to the stabbies, not some uh, thing uh, out of Wuhan. But what, what's really dangerous is the, the individuals who have had their DNA changed, unfortunately. So in my view, uh, when we look at something like Ukraine uh, and the same, same situation with Syria, we get the same outfits that, uh, you know, Bellingcat, et cetera. They discover the intelligence. They discover the source. They discover the leak. Much of this, in my view, is fabricated. And so you can see a direct line of the, the types of propaganda that we used uh, with white helmets, with Syria. Exact same propaganda techniques used uh, in the last few years for uh, the Ukraine. And this uh, uh, provoked conflict uh, 
uh, and, and especially when we get into the bio labs and, and uh, the provocations of the last seven years. I mean, this is obviously something that was intended by the West and by the neocons to provoke uh, this conflict. And then to blame, you know, the, the West cries out, right, as it strikes you, this kind of a situation. If you've seen the famous meme that goes around all the time, I, mean, I, think, that, I think that's really appropriate. So uh, it's really the same thing applied from World War One all the way up until today. The techniques are all the same. They just get more and more sophisticated, even though they seem more and more low tier and low brow. Uh, there's actually, I think, something sophisticated in that, uh, in that sort of low te- low tier propaganda. But um, yeah, that's where we are. Is basically mindless, made up nonsense on a on a daily basis that that just barrages everybody at every level. You drive through Texas, you see giant Ukraine flags. I don't know what that has to do with Texas, but but uh, yeah, just mindlessness on a mass scale, um, relying on the lobotomized public, unfortunately.